morning, everybody. Morning. I'm Dustin, one of the pastors and elders here. Um, first, I believe I need to dismiss the older kids with Amy and Lana right there and Stephen. So if you want to head off to your uh, discussion and learning time with those guys, that would be awesome. When I, uh, I've got so many of these stories that begin with uh, when I lived in New York City, but uh, here, here's another one. Uh, when I lived in New York City, uh, there was a, a young college student in my church from Arkansas who hadn't lived in the city for very long, so he was particularly susceptible to being conned immediately upon his arrival. And... One night he called me and was incredibly upset. He wanted me to come and meet him, and I did. And I sat down, and I listened to his story, and he told me what, he, what had happened. He said that uh, there was a, he met a man on the street that appeared to be blind and was walking cautiously on the sidewalk up on 34th Avenue by the Empire State Building. The, he, he stopped, and my, my, my kind friend stopped and asked if, if he could help him get somewhere out of the goodness of his heart. And the man said that uh, he was from Africa and he was trying to get to the airport. His, uh, his brother had just died and the funeral was that day. He also said that his brother had left him $10,000 to give away to a charity while he was in um, the U.S., but he didn't have time to do that work. And so uh, you can kind of see where this is going. This is like a real live Nigerian prince thing happening, like on the street level. So he asked my friend if he would be willing to give the $10,000 to charity if he gave it to him and said, you know, for your troubles, you can keep a thousand of it. And so my friend uh, was like, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> but he wanted to make sure my friend wasn't hard up for money. Because he didn't want to give it to somebody that would just like steal the whole thing. He wanted to make sure my friend had a little cash in the bank. So my dumb friend um, <laughs> went and uh, withdrew $1,000 from his account at the bank. The $1,000 his dad had given him to buy a computer at the beginning of his college career at NYU. And uh, so he came back with $1,000 cash. And the guy unwrapped a newspaper, and there was a, there was a stack of cash in the newspaper. And so the guy took the money, put it on the stack, wrapped it back up in the newspaper, and then asked my friend if he would mind praying for him first, and, you know, so, and then, you know, before he, he went off back to, to Africa. So my, my good, kind-hearted friend closed his eyes, prayed for the man, and then took the newspaper, put it in his bag, and went back to his dorm room. And he, he gets back to his dorm room, and he, he opens the bag, and he pulls the newspaper out, and he, he unwraps it, and there's nothing. My friend is devastated. He kind of realizes, obviously, um, <laughs> what happened. So when he closed, the dummy closed his eyes to pray for this guy, he swapped out the newspapers, and kept all the cash and, uh, and gave my friend nothing. Now, w when you think about it, I mean, this, is, this is an unlikely scenario to ever happen in real life. I couldn't believe I was hearing this. I was trying not to laugh as he was telling me this. Thankfully, it was only $1,000, but he was crushed, and his dad, uh, I think, would probably uh, killed him. I didn't see him much after that. But <laughs> he, uh, how, how would you describe, what adjectives would you use to describe my friend's actions? Naive, yeah, that's a good one. Gullible. <laughs> What's that? Optimistic. That's a kind way. Yes, very, very trusting. Innocent. Compassionate. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, this kid, who I'm still Facebook friends with, I won't tell you his name, um, lost his, his dad's $1,000, not, not do, due to poor management, like some of us have, have lost money in the past, but due to a kind yet very naive heart. I, I wonder, have you ever lost 
uh, any kind of money like that? Or ever been conned out of money? I know it's hard to admit in a, in a public <laughs> group of like, yeah, I totally <laughs> got conned. But um, have you ever lost a, a large, you know, what to you at the time or whatever, it was a large amount of money? Has that ever happened to you? We're all pretty, pretty good with that. Nobody's ever lost any money. John, John has. Nobody's lost any money in here. It's amazing. <laughs> What's that? I did like six weeks ago. The kid came to the door selling magazines. Came ah. Came to the door selling magazines. Gave him $100. He hasn't got any magazines yet. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, only 20 bucks. Yeah, there's, there's so many of those stories. Um, yeah, Kelly and I have had our share of those stories of these, of really like well thought out stories to, you know, it's like, I just need $20, my car was towed, I just need 20 more, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. I have a problem with travel like since I was about to connect to your country with the currency I don't understand, and I don't fully know the exchange rate, and I don't really need cash, I'll withdraw something. How does that feel to lose money like that? Kurt, how does that feel? Not good. <laughs> Not good. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is, but anytime, I, I kind of, a similar thing, Kurt, out of the kindness of my heart, threw away $60, this guy in the, in the neighborhood not too long ago, I'm embarrassed to even talk about, but it's, I thought about it for days. I thought about, I, for days I felt so stupid and foolish that I had lost this money for something so dumb. It, it's a terrible feeling to lose money. I think there's a reason for that. We're continuing our uh, series in Luke, uh, and uh, we're, we're making some progress here. We're still, we're still due to end in Easter next year, so that's good. Um, we've been here for a while, but if you've got a Bible, you can flip open to Luke 16. Uh, if not... It will be on the screen. Jesus is telling another story. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, What's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you're going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, well, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. Weird currency exchange thing at that time, I guess. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him a thousand bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. So it's kind of an interesting beginning to a, a, a story. You kind of wonder what's going on. But not much different than today. To manage a rich person's stuff was a position of trust. And this time, though, a manager was considered a member of the household controlled his boss's assets, made decisions as if he was the boss himself. He had full authority over everything. So you'd have to come pretty highly regarded to get a, a job like that to begin with. But it also wouldn't take much to get canned if it turned out you, you weren't very good at it or you were dishonest or just incompetent. If you were fired, you're likely you'd never get a job managing someone else's household again. 
And so this man was obviously found to be kind of careless with his boss's stuff. So his boss gave him notice that he's going to lose his job, which meant he's going to lose his house as well. He's in trouble. And after a quick brainstorm, he realizes that he's not really cut out for manual labor, which I can understand that, and he's not about to stand on the street corner begging for money. So he's kind of in a, in a, in a pickle. So he comes up with this great plan, and basically his plan is this. I'm going to meet with the people that owe my boss money and cut their debt substantially. And I, I love this idea because he thinks, well, you know, uh, maybe if, if I get booted from the house, these people that have seen my kindness will return my favor. At the very least, maybe they'll remember my kindness and let me crash on the floor. It's not a bad plan. But when you hear that, you kind of wonder, well, well, how would the master respond to something like this? Because he's the one losing money, right? And I imagine the disciples have got to be wondering, like, man, I, I bet the master is going to rip this guy apart. And I love this. Verse 8. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And Jesus continues, and it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of light. Hmm. I love this because despite the fact that it came at his expense, and it's great, the rich man's like, well, i got to hand it to the guy. This is pretty smart. He was clever. He, he used what he had at his possession to make sure his future was secure. And so the rich man says he admired the manager for being shrewd. What does that mean? What, what do you think that means, to be shrewd? What, what's he saying here? What's he admiring? Okay, a combination of intelligence and sneakiness. Guts, yeah. Some level of like confidence to do that with somebody else's money. Yeah, it's a level of confidence to do something like that with someone else's money. Yeah. To me, the shrewd guy is the guy who always gets the best bargain, right? The best deal. He's to recognize the situation and kind of get the best thing for himself. Out. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Kind of looks out for things and usually gets the best bargain or deal for himself. Devin's kind of like that. He's not here today, but he's always like, "It's crazy! I pay eight bucks a month for cable." I'm like, what? How do, you do that? Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, yeah. He's always saying stuff like that. <laughs> Devin is the shrewd guy in the story. <clears throat> yeah, but there's a there's a certain level of cleverness of of awareness of how things work. Um, they're discerning. Usually, uh, the word a lot of times means simply wise. And here's the thing. Th this guy may have been dishonest in his previous dealings, but technically he didn't really do anything wrong here. He still is fully in charge of his master's stuff, still has the ability to make any decisions he wants. And what's most brilliant about this plan is that even though his boss is losing money in this deal, it still makes the boss himself look incredibly generous with the people that he does business with. And cutting so much of the, the debt that the debtors owe. It's a win-win, really. The boss comes out looking generous. The fired manager finds some favor with some of these other people that have influence in, in his community. They could possibly help him out. And then Jesus makes a statement. He says, And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of light. Isn't that interesting? What do you think Jesus means by this? What's he trying to tell us? Why this observation? I think partially he's, he's kind of criticizing a little bit of how naive his disciples can be. But he's making this sharp contrast. If the people of this world are smart and resourceful in their dealings with the world for their own gain, 
shouldn't my followers be wise and resourceful and clever with what they have for the kingdom? He's setting up a pretty sharp contrast there. For those who are Christ followers, are, are we as wise, intelligent, diligent with how we use our resources for the kingdom as Mark Cuban is, is how he uses his resources for his own dominion? That's kind of the question that I think we're meant to ask. And then we get to verse 9, which is kind of a summary statement that Jesus makes of the story. He says, here's the lesson. I'm glad he's clearing this up for us, because it is kind of a confusing story. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. It seems like these, these friends that Jesus is talking about are those that are in the kingdom of God or have entered eternity as a result of our ministry. Those whose lives have been touched in a significant way through the use, very specifically, of our money and our stuff. He's saying, put yourself in a good position through your use of money which can so easily lead us astray, so that when your life is over, those that you have impacted will be able to joyfully receive you into the kingdom. One thing is, is for sure. Our, our money and possessions will all go somewhere, right? I know a lot of times we, it's easy to forget that. We, we can't hang on to it. But Jesus says the only thing that will endure is that which has been invested in others for the sake of Christ and the gospel. The only thing that has lasting significance is what we do with our money and our resources and our time, everything that's been given to us that will make some kind of lasting impact on others' lives for the gospel. So in the same way the steward invested his money wisely with his future in perspective, those who consider themselves Christ followers are invited to do the same for our eternal future as well. And then we get some more implications, uh, and this is kind of the end of, of this passage in, in 10 to 14. Jesus says, If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? If you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who dearly loved their money, heard all this and scoffed at him. Think about when you were a kid, the way things kind of worked logically with your parents. You know, if you couldn't be trusted with things like using your parents' money and being trusted to return the change, you know, they're not going to trust you with bigger things like letting you spend the night at your friend's house. Or if you couldn't keep your room clean, your parents probably aren't going to trust you to, to take care of, have responsibility over a pet, right? The logic's simple. Trust is something that is earned over time. And those tests of trust usually start, start with the smaller things. And God says it's the, same way, it's the same way that I work with people. Jesus implies that we're being tested in little ways all the time of how we handle and manage opportunities and resources and money to see if we're trustworthy to be trusted with, with greater things of responsibility. And if God can't find us trustworthy, faithful with what he's given us, how could God possibly trust us with, with anything else? Which, you know, one of the things that this passage does, I think, is it invalidates a lot of our, um, our if-onlys. And I've run these through my mind as well. That kind of, well, if only I made some more money, you know, then I would, you know, fill in the blank. Then I would sponsor a child. If only I had more in savings, then I would, I would be able to give to the church or be able to give to our fund to clean water in Haiti. If I had less student loans or credit card debt, I would 
you know, whatever it is. And the point is, if I'm not faithfully using the money that I do have in service of God's kingdom in some way, I would be just as unfaithful with my money if I were filthy rich. That's the way God looks at it. So the issue isn't so much as what I would do with a million dollars if I had it, which that's, that's a fun game to play. But what am I doing with the $100 that I have? What am I doing with the $10 that I actually do have? It sounds like those situations are just as important to God. But if we're not being faithful what He's already entrusted to us, despite how small it may be in, in the grand scheme of things, why would He trust us with more specific, more significant responsibilities? What we do with a little time, a little talent, a little money tells God a lot. And when it comes down to it, how we use our time, our money, our stuff indicates who it is that we trust. Who we think is in charge of the world. Nothing quite reveals that like the way that we use our resources. Who do we trust? And in that regard, Jesus makes a really hard dichotomy here. You know, I know we hate things that are, that are so black and white. They're, they're, that he makes so clear. But you cannot serve both God and money. He says you will hate one and love the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You know, it's kind of similar to that parable we talked about a couple years ago, years ago. I think we did, but a couple of weeks ago, where Jesus says that unless you hate your mother and father, you cannot follow him. And again, what is he getting at there? He's saying it's a matter of priority, giving priority to one over the other. God and money cannot both be a priority in your life. It's impossible because both of those pursuits, whether you're pursuing God, you're pursuing money and resources and security and those things, both of those pursuits are all-consuming. They're all-encompassing. In fact, Jesus personifies wealth or money with this word mammon, which is this personification of a false god. He's saying you can't serve both God and money because they're both, they both have a power that totally encompasses everything that you're about. That it's a worship issue. But you know, even despite that warning, oh. hi Brooklyn. <laughs> to be fair, I was supposed to be watching. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, that's totally what I assumed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't going to run across the front. I thought it was a Yeah, that would have distracted everybody. <laughs> Thank you for restraining yourself. <laughs> In any case, um, but despite this warning that Jesus gives that we cannot serve both or love both God and money, you know, I think a lot of us are tempted to think that maybe we're the exception, you know, that maybe uh, we can kind of secure both some way that maybe people haven't thought about before. Maybe we can live for the American dream and its endless pursuit of security, productivity, desire, gratification, and still be a Christ follower, even though that's kind of, you know, on the side. And I think because of that, many people end up sacrificing Jesus on the altar to mammon, to money, to this false god. It's tough, you know, how we spend our money, I think, tells us with incredible accuracy what we care about the most. So I guess, you know, the question is, can we look at our bank accounts and see that what we care about is what God cares about? Our budget and our, our bank account are, are one of the most accurate indicators of our priorities. We, we give our money to what is a priority to us, what we care about, what we love and value. 
which is probably why 17 of Jesus' 38 parables are about money. Isn't that crazy? 17 of 38 are about money and possessions because he knows the power that they have over us. So if someone were to look at your online statement and see how you spend, how you invest, how you save your money, would they be able to tell what God you serve? That's a hard question. It's a challenging question in our day. We, we live and breathe in this consumeristic society where it's not uncommon for our hobbies to include shopping and eating. Isn't that weird? Our consumptive impulses and, and de- desire for more money to support these cravings to consume, to buy, to purchase, to own, to use, are so powerful and yet wildly incompatible with the self-denying, self-giving kind of life that Jesus models for us. But this is important, because so far this would be kind of a bummer, really. Um, You know, yeah, just thinking through finances and and looking at the way Kelly and I uh, are challenged um, with, you know, with debt and stuff and where we we give our money. But this is important. While where we give our money, time, possessions, etc., it doesn't, it, it reveals our heart, but what we give our money toward can also be a means of transforming our heart. Jesus makes a statement in Matthew where he says, where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. I really recommend meditating and thinking about that. Very, very strongly recommend thinking through that. Where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. In other words, one way to look at that is you will start to care about what it is that you give your money toward, what it is that's important to you. When you start to give away what's valuable to you, what it is you're giving it away toward becomes incredibly valuable to you as well. So if you start investing 5% of your income in something like giving people clean water in Haiti, guess what you're going to care about? Guess what's going to catch your attention when it's on the news? It's going to be Haiti and people getting clean water there. If you start investing your Sunday afternoon at Home PDX, I guarantee you that you will start to care very deeply about the people that you're, you're building relationships with at Home PDX because you're investing your time and that's valuable to you. Many of us uh, think that it works the opposite way. We kind of think it's more like, well, when I start caring, then I'll start giving. I think that's the way a lot of us think about that. When I start caring, Then I'll start giving. And Jesus says, no, 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 it's totally the opposite of that. When I start giving, then I will start caring. He said it's totally the opposite. If you want to care about something, deeply care about something, just start giving some of your money toward it. Start investing some of your time toward it. I guarantee you that you will care about that thing very deeply. That it will start to reflect the things that God cares about. When we give away what is valuable to us, the very thing that we're giving it towards becomes valuable to us. It's a way of transformation. And the God of mammon, the God of money, starts to lose its power, starts to lose its grip on us. Because that's not the most important thing to us anymore. You know, this entire way of thinking and all of Jesus' parables on money start with the presupposition that everything we have has been given to us as a gift from God. If we don't believe that, if we don't start out reading the parables about money and possessions as if everything that we have is because we receive it from God, none of Jesus' parables about money are going to make any sense to us. That if we see money as ours, 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 because we earned it, we worked hard for it, we deserve it, Jesus' parables aren't going to make sense. But if all we have is God's anyway... And we're simply the manager of it. What kind of manager should we be? Think for a minute about your budget. I know this is really thrilling. 
Think for a minute about your budget. And I suppose, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but I suppose test number one in this, this whole thing of being shrewd and discerning and intelligent with our money is that we actually have a budget. That we're thinking about where our money's going, how it's coming in, what we're doing with it. If we don't, if we're not thinking about that, that's probably step number one in, in being a shrewd steward that Jesus is talking about. But in your head, as you think through your budget, and you think about where your money goes, just, just list, if you can, a couple of things that's on there. What are a couple of ways that you're intentionally using your money to honor God and impact other people's lives in some way? It's very broad, I know. Just think about that for a minute. What are a couple ways that you have chosen, you are intentionally investing your money in some kind of bigger kingdom thing? It's not to benefit you, but it's to benefit somebody else. And in light of that, in light of your budget, in light of the way you've chosen to, you know, to give your money, how would you describe yourself as a manager of God's resources? Or in other words, if you were God and you were kind of browsing through your, you know, your, your budget, would you promote you? Would, you? would you want to give you more responsibility in managing things that are more important than money? Or would you want to give you less responsibility? Or, or would you fire you? There are important questions to consider in light of Jesus' story. What kind of manager are you of the resources that God has given you? Jesus' story tells us pretty clearly that if he cannot trust us with worldly, temporary wealth, how could he possibly trust us with more important things, more lasting spiritual things? You know, sometimes we uh, mistakenly believe that God despises riches or wealth, right? Right? But in fact, it's God that gives them to us. What God despises is the misuse of wealth, the unjust gain of wealth. And on the other hand, what he rewards is good stewardship, good management of wealth. He doesn't tell us, some of us maybe need to do this, he he told one person this in, in the Gospels for sure, But what he doesn't tell all of us is to stay away from money and possessions. But he tells us to use them strategically and thoughtfully, to be wise, to be clever, to use all of your mind and intellect and will and the management of money in a way that will glorify God and most impact the lives of others around you. Um, Kind of to wrap things up here, I was um, just contemplating... Jesus is teaching this week and and recollecting all of the people that have um, just impacted my life with the use of their money and resources in the past. And I've told you guys the story before of um, growing up with a single mom, trying to take care of of three kids on very little money. Um, We never had money for extra stuff. Um, But when I was 12 years old, uh, a family in town, Steve and Rose, uh, paid my way to go um, with their son to a Christian camp a couple of times in the summer, um, which was awesome. But it was there that I first heard the gospel, although it would take a few more years for that to really take root. But that, that was meaningful. Um, there was a, an older couple, Pete and Janet, who were neighbors that were right across the street from where we lived. And out of the kindness of their heart, they, they let me use their driveway. They had a basketball hoop on the garage, which was awesome. This huge concrete pad, you know, with a three-point line painted. It was amazing. They, they, they let me use that any time of day or night, essentially, I'm pretty sure, just to keep me out of trouble, which was good because my mom was always gone. It gave me something to do. And I spent hours there at the cost of them listening to a dribbling basketball almost all the time, which now as, as an older grumpy guy, you know, when somebody's dribbling the ball in the street, I'm like, who's doing that? Like, who's waking up my kids? You know, I'm like a grumpy old man. But they spent years listening to me, you know, shoot hoops in their driveway because of their kindness. 
when I decided to go to Bible college and pursue um, this weird vocation of being a pastor, a couple in the church, Bob and Becky, committed to um, pay for my books every semester through college, which they did. And it is, it's honestly, as I was reflecting on all this, it, it's, it's overwhelming to think of all of the incredible people who I've seen be faithful to Jesus with their use of money and resources and time and possessions, the way that they've invested that in the kingdom of God and other people around them, that they loved God more than money, literally changed everything for me. It's the reason that I'm a follower of Jesus. It's the reason that I'm, I'm sitting up here right now. Because someone had a bigger view of what they had rather than just, oh, this is all for me. But like Bob prayed in the beginning from John Bailey, they held their stuff with open hands and said, oh, this stuff has actually just been given to me by God to bless others. Isn't that an amazing way to live? And it makes me ask myself, how can I follow their legacy, their example, and in investing my time, my money, my resources for the furtherance of the kingdom of God? How can you? And who is it that will embrace you and say thank you when your time of managing life's possessions is up. Let's pray and then I'll invite us to take communion together. God, we confess that we are a people that love money. We love what it can do for us. We love the power that it brings us. We love the things that we can buy with it. But God, even for those of us who don't have money, it's easy to, to be thinking about money all the time. About how we're going to get more of it. How we're going to pay debt. It's so all-consuming. God, would you help to, to free us from the power of this God of money? Would you set us free from consumption and greed and productivity and all of the other things that the American dream tells us is gospel? Lord, we want to be a people that eternally impacts friends and neighbors and family with the use of our money and time and resources. God, help us to hold those things with an open hand. God, help us to model your life of self-giving, self-denying for the sake of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to come as we sing and take communion. Um, you know, one of the things people ask now and again is, well, well who, who can come and receive communion? And our answer has really always been, whoever desires it. Whoever wants to come and receive what it is that Christ offers. So if you want that, if you want to come and receive this, this bread, Christ's body broken for you, in your place, on your behalf, come and receive. If you want to come and receive... The, the wine or the juice, the blood of Christ has been shed for you. It's been poured out for you so that we could experience new life. Come and receive that. Um, we do that at remembrance every week of Christ's offer of new life and what he's accomplished for us and his death and resurrection. So if you would, as we sing, come and celebrate and reflect and rejoice in what God our Savior has done for us.
invite everybody to stand up with me if you'd like for the last song. like to do every week is have a little bit of time at the end to ask that question. Um, what, do, what do you sense God saying to you today? Or what do you sense God saying to us today as a community? So I wanted to throw that question out there and, and uh, see if you guys had anything that was going through your mind this morning. Yeah, sir.
Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that makes sense. No, I, I totally relate to that. And these passages of um, of that first place you go is feeling guilt of like, oh, I'm not, I'm not doing enough. I'm not giving enough. Um, and that's not necessarily. I mean, maybe that's true for you know for some individuals, but like who see that and recognize, oh, you know, I haven't really been thinking about or intentionally intentional about where I'm investing my money, whether that's you know these short-term things, or, or if I'm looking more long-term at the kingdom of God and how I can, you know, um, use my money to invest in things that last. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. It's, it's kind of what I want to say of not, you know, going to that place of guilt, um, but, but more of like, oh, okay, well, what are we doing that, you know, that serves into the kingdom? So I, I hope a talk like this is encouraging for a lot of people, not just one of those where we're all kind of like hang our heads and walk out the door like, oh, I felt like crap today. But I hope it is encouraging because Jesus invites us to a way of life that is, that is unique, that is life-giving, that, that, you know, in that way of giving that really blesses us, um, where, where we receive long-term gains, some of which we don't even understand yet. I mean, he's inviting us into, into the blessed life, into the good life, which varies drastically from what, you know, our culture tells us is the good life. Um, so it's an exciting thing. It's not a it's not a guilt or it's not a burdening thing. Jesus is like, oh, he's asking us to do this really hard thing again. That's gonna suck. It's like no, he's inviting us to the best way of life possible um, with the way he set up the world. That's the way the world works. Is that when you give, then you receive, then you're blessed, then you're living the good life. But I love that. I love that about his teaching. Yeah, Nathan. Money is such a personal thing to talk about. It, you know, in church especially. I mean, you can. People get more uncomfortable probably when we talk about money than you know, doing a series on sex or something like that. I mean, it's such a personal thing, but it's also a super spiritual thing that, you know, it's like, well, I'm reading my Bible all the time and I'm praying, so I'm really good. But let's not go, let's not talk about what I'm doing with my money, because that's a different thing. And it's, it's not. I mean, obviously, the percentage of, you know, how much Jesus talks about, it's, it's a huge deal. And it's a very spiritual thing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, money is a very spiritual thing. You're right. That's a, that's a good thought. Yeah, Dick. So I'm struggling with this shrewd management. Is that like a good example or a bad example? I'm not too generous. <laughs> but I see him being stingy almost. He's doing it for his own good. So, so it's like he can be generous as well as wise and shrewd at the same time and so on. And then one example of that is where you get your money and being wise about where it goes. I mean, I, I get asked every day for money on the street, but I never get it. So am I, am I being ungenerous or am I being shrewd and aware? Well, then, like, same thing with charities. Which charities do you support? You know, we can be shrewd in terms of looking into that, investing our own time into those charities to see if the money can be used effectively. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's, that's a way to be generous. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of room for discussion on that. That's for sure. Yeah, that's a good thought. Time us up. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and Bryn come up um, to do our announcements and, and blessing or opportunities and blessing. Sorry. Um, but thank you for being a part of the conversation today. Um, there's certainly more that we can we can talk about. Um, one thing, if I'm Remembering it, I want to welcome the Seamers back with Madeline. Madeline is somewhere. Um, but yeah, good to see you guys. And uh, so make sure you say hi to the Seamers and their new um, baby girl. How are you guys doing? Yeah? Is, let me just ask this one question. Is she sleeping as well as the boys did? Ah. <laughs> well, I'm really sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, good to see you guys. Can you guys hear me? So really quick, we just have a couple of um, opportunities. First and foremost, because it's the most awesome, is the uh, community dinner that's coming up in November on the 10th. And it's a Saturday night, and if you are a part of Evergreen in any way, shape, or form, this is an awesome opportunity for you to get to know more people. Um, people just host different places, different uh, houses, and then you sign up on the table and go to their house for dinner. You can bring something. They usually post there, like what the main dish is, and then you just kind of show up and it's good. If you've been around for a while, try to choose someone that you don't know very well. If you're new and you're going to go, you can just choose anyone you want. Because you probably know not as everybody, not everyone quite as well. Um, and if you, we still have places if people want to sign up and host, and you don't have to have an awesome table and matching china or anything like that to host. You can just have an apartment and a couch and a couple of chairs or a floor or a, a folding table, all that good stuff. Um, so please sign up soon so that people can kind of get an idea of how many they're going to be hosting. Um, and that is all on the table. Also, we have a theology pub coming up, um, the Skeletons in God's Closet, which sounds super cool. And it's, they're, they're doing a different format. It's not meeting every week for a couple of weeks. They're doing a book, and you meet once a month. So if you have kind of a more busy, a busy schedule, this would be a great way for you to plug in and do that and not have to meet every um, week for a long time. Um, we have a volunteer appreciation dinner coming up. And it's at Ex Novo. And so if you've been a part of the children's ministry or set up or worship or just anything that we do, this is for you. We would love for you to come so we can thank you properly and give you a nice uh, meal and just, just love on you a little bit to say thanks. Um, please, RSVP, if you have volunteered in any of those positions, you should have gotten an email with an evite. If you haven't, please contact one of the staff members. Um, just talk to Dustin, actually. Um, <laughs> And they'll get you on the list so you can sign up and, and come and be a part of that. Does anybody else have a, another announcement before I bless us and go? No one? Green cards. Green cards and offering box. Offering box is that cool one in the back that uh, is all wooden and awesome. Um, if you would stand with me, I will bless us. And then we can go. Evergreen this week. May we intentionally use our time and our resources to benefit someone else, and may God be honored through our actions. Go in peace.